Hello, this is the Fiction Nonfiction Podcast from Literary Hub, where we believe that every issue in your Twitter feed or on the evening news has already been tackled somewhere in literature. I'm Vivi Ganeshananthan, also known as Sugi, author of the novel Love Marriage. And I'm Whitney Terrell, the author of the novel The Good Lieutenant. And we've chronicled a lot of negative 2020 milestones on the show. I don't know that there's another kind of 2020 milestone. Um, the arrival of COVID-19, the deaths of quarter million Americans, the protests over the murder of George Floyd, the first time a president has refused to accept a democratically run election. Is there going to be <laughs> a but in there? Is there, yeah, I'm just is a, there I'm some just improvement a... on this list? Because it makes me depressed about our whole entire past season. Well, I was just going to have a litany of complaints, but... This okay. year marks the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities when it comes to employment, transportation, public accommodations, communications, and access to government programs and services. And that's good if it is, as you will hear our guests talk about later, also an imperfect measure. And I'm 100% on board with that, which is why today we're going to talk to two writers who have made important contributions to the way we talk and write about disability in America. Later in the show, we'll be speaking with Rebecca Tossig about her new book, Sitting Pretty, The View from My Ordinary Resilient Disabled Body. But first, we're thrilled to welcome poet and essayist Molly McCulley Brown to the show. Brown is the author of the poetry collection, The Virginia State Colony for Epileptics and Feeble-Minded, which won the 2016 Lexi Rudnitsky First Book Prize and was named a New York Times Critics Top Book of 2017 and the recent essay collection, Places I've Taken My Body. With Susanna Nevison, she is also the co-author of the poetry collection, In the Field Between Us. Brown has been the recipient of the Amy Lowell Poetry Traveling Fellowship, Scholarship, a United States Artist Fellowship, a Civitella Ranieri Foundation Fellowship, and the Jeff Baskin Writers Fellowship from the Oxford American Magazine. Her poems and essays have appeared or are forthcoming in the Paris Review, Tin House, Crazy Horse, The New York Times, Pleiades, The Yale Review, Blackbird, and elsewhere. She lives in Gambier, Ohio, and teaches at Kenyon College, where she is the Kenyon Review Fellow in Poetry. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. We're very happy to have you here. Our, uh, every semester, we I have, I have a couple of interns from the UMKC Creative Writing Program who work on the show and they often, they get to choose and craft an episode and this is one of theirs. And uh, our intern, Mary Hen, was a huge fan of your work and so I was very happy to have you on the show, as are we, but we have to give, yeah. we want to give her a shout out there. Um, your recent collection of essays, Places I've Taken My Body, explores the complexities of living with cerebral palsy and came out in June, just a few months after the pandemic hit. What has it been like releasing and promoting a book during that period of time? <laughs> you know, rough. I think anybody putting out a book right now um, would have that to say. It's hard to kind of um, both be in a moment when the sort of a lot of the typical avenues for, for promoting work um, are hard access. You can't go to travel. You can't go give in-person readings. Um, and also when people's attention is uh, rightly and necessarily uh, often elsewhere, as is mine. We're all sort of focused on the... Um, the really complicated realities of the world around us. Um, but I will say that I think it it's also yielded some some opportunities that that wouldn't have come about otherwise. You know, the, the ability to 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 do these virtual readings that we've all sort of figured out how to do and have people tune in from from all over the country and all over the world is a really extraordinary thing. In addition to your own experiences and and the others that you're talking about here, places I've taken my body. Um, also considers the American eugenics movement, which is the crux of your poetry collection, the Virginia State Colony for Epileptics and Feeble-Minded, uh, especially the erasure poems in the latter half of the collection. Could you talk a little bit about your commitment to that subject in your writing? Yeah, so the Virginia State Colony for Epileptics and Feeble-Minded um, was a real place um, that from the, the early uh, to mid 1900s was a, a government run residential hospital um, that was one of the major hubs of the American eugenics movement in um, in the country. And what that means essentially is that thousands and thousands of people who either had or were perceived to have a variety of physical and intellectual disabilities were forcibly committed and forcibly sterilized there. Um, not only without their consent, but often without their knowledge, they were told that they were being given appendectomies um, and then were sterilized instead. 
And I grew up um, just a few miles from the grounds of the former colony, um, which is atypical in terms of these eugenicist institutions because until um, really only about six months ago, um, it remained an operational residential facility for adults um, and children with serious disabilities. Um, and it's a kind of strange place because like a lot of things in the rural South, um, it was built on an enormous amount of land. And so the when the original buildings um, from the colony fell into disrepair, instead of either m moving out of them um, and knocking them down and building new buildings or um, rehabbing them so that they were up to code, the um, they just sort of built new buildings next door. So the, the institution is this really strange combination of um, a kind of ghost town of this eugenicist facility and, and a functioning hospital. Um, and I think growing up um, as a person with cerebral palsy, um, which is a, a pretty significant and visible physical disability, um, in the sort of immediate vicinity of this place, um, I, I kind of got interested in it um, as, a, as a young person in college and interested too in the, um, the sort of reality of the fact that if I had been born in this same part of the world, the part of the world that is my home and means a lot to me, um, even 50 or 60 years earlier, um, I might have been a prime candidate to be a colony patient. Um, and I think as a part of my interest in that proximity um, and distance, and also in um, the sort of ways in which literature can be used in service of social justice and as sort of historical and emotional record. Um, I got really interested in writing about the place. So as you point out, my, my first book is set entirely um, in the colony in the mid-1930s at the height of the sterilization movement. In the midst of this global crisis, the elderly population, as well as those with disabilities and minority groups, have been largely disregarded. Um, how do you connect with that current mindset and the treatment and treatment with things that have happened historically, like at this facility that, you, that you've written about? Well, so I think one of the things that was so interesting to me um, in doing research about the eugenics movement um, in America was the fact that was the, the sort of degree to which it became clear that that two things were the case. And one uh, is of course that that uh, populations that were in any way marginalized um, suffered and and were were sterilized and penalized um, at much greater rates than than other parts of the population. So that means if you were um, impoverished, um, if you were undereducated, um, if you were a person of color, if you had a very visible disability um, or a very extreme disability, you were you were much more likely um, to be sterilized at one of these facilities than if you if you had uh, other particular kinds of privilege. Um, and I think we're seeing, you know, in this pandemic, that 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 is continuing to hold true, right? Um, pop, uh, populations that are um, that already were marginalized, um, lacked resources, um, were suffering in other ways in our country, are suffering to a greater degree during this pandemic. Um, and I think the other thing that that became really clear to me as I was was working on the first book and then continuing to think about um, eugenics in America uh, while writing my essay collection was that the one of the there were two sort of primary forces that made. Um, the eugenics movement take off in the states in the way that it did. And one of them was this notion that the people who were being sterilized were somehow not complete and whole people, right? Um, that, that the reason that they were defective, the reason that it was better to sterilize them, the reason that it was better to shut them away and siphon them off from the community was that they didn't, they weren't in possession of whole and complete inner lives. They weren't adding value to the world. Um, and they were people who, um, as much as, as uh, eugenicist doctors would sometimes talk and pay lip service to the idea that this was done for their benefits, the idea was really that it was done for society's benefit, right? That that's, um, we were better off with, without them. Um, and, and I think I, I, I hear troubling echoes um, of that in the way that some people have talked about populations that are especially vulnerable in this pandemic, right? The idea of like, oh yeah, well, it's, you know, the people who are dying from it are the people with pre-existing conditions. There are people who are, there are people who are older, there are people who are less valuable somehow in the, in well, the like world. Well, like that guy, who's the state, uh, no, he's the, 
lieutenant governor of Texas who was like, well, you just got to let the old people die. I'll, I'll go yeah. too. You know, I was a bunch that? of people. It was a it bunch was, of people. <laughs> it was it a was really wild. troubling number yeah. of people. Yeah. And it was, and not only that, it was this idea too. Did you hear the, like, I think it was, I think it was this guy that you're talking about who said like, you know, I think most, most grandparents would like want to sacrifice themselves yeah, yeah. That's for what their he grandchildren, said. right? This idea of like, not only is it like an acceptable loss, but in fact, like people who are vulnerable in this way or, or who need in this way um, are somehow burdensome and should be willing to sort of sacrifice their own existences as a way of sort of getting out of the, getting out of the way. And that, that's, that is, I think, a really pervasive and really troubling way of thinking. It was like volunteering people who, and then if you sort of went and did, you know, there were some journalists who went and did interviews with um, disabled and elderly persons who were sort of like, when would, how did it become acceptable for people to talk like this? Um, and they were talking like that on network television. Um, and it was Dan it was, Patrick. I just want to get his name was, in there. Was so that who it was? Remember him for history. Yeah, I think he, he, deserves to, a, he deserves to be named and named just, and called out. Yeah. I just Googled a headline. I found a headline in Vanity Fair. It says, Dan Patrick says old people should volunteer to die for the economy. That's nice. It was it's, like he yeah. volunteered them himself. He was like, <laughs> I don't know. I just, it was so interesting, like the ageism overlapping with um, the way that people were talking about disabled people. And and I think that we we're sort of, re I, I mean, I'm, the way that I live in Minneapolis um, and I mean, hospitals are getting full. And so people are starting to have conversations about how they're going to choose who's going to get treatment. And I know those conversations are happening in other parts of the country as well. And so I feel like right. that talk, which was part of the beginning of the pandemic is resurfacing. Yeah. It absolutely is. And I think it's really important to sort of be explicit about the fact that that these conversations that we're having about like, oh, isn't it so horrible that 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 people, um, you know, think this way and would go to the extreme of saying like grandparents should sacrifice old people should sacrifice themselves for young people and should die like that is the sort of like most extreme verbalized extension of this rhetoric, but the rhetoric of like, what constitutes a valuable life and if we have to make decisions about limited resources and limited care that has real lived mortal consequences for especially for people with with disabilities molly we wondered if you could read to us a little bit from that particular essay sure so this is an essay um from kind of dead smack in the center um of my essay for what kind of places i take in my body um, and it's called the Virginia State Colony for Epileptics and Feeble-Minded, which is also the title of my poetry collection. And it sort of narrates and traces um, how I came to, to write that poetry collection and also how I came to think about um, my own relationship to the history of disability and to internalized ableism um, and all of those things. And so I'll start in the middle of the essay um, like this. Um, I remember hearing about the doctor who told my parents when I was born in 1991 that I would probably never live independently, might never even speak. I felt time and space collapse. 65 years ago, born in my hometown, I might have lived and died in the colony, been buried in that field. I went home that day and Googled the training center under its old name. I read a little about Carrie Buck, the colony inmate who'd been named plaintiff in Buck v. Bell, the 1927 Supreme Court case that upheld Virginia sterilization laws and made eugenic sterilization legal throughout the United States. Forced to undergo compulsory sterilization after she was committed to the colony while pregnant, Carrie was the perfect subject for testing the legal sturdiness of new sterilization statutes. She was declared the feeble-minded daughter of a feeble-minded mother, the first of three children with three different fathers. She and her family were the ideal lineage for eugenicists to cite when arguing that defectives would overrun the population with their mental, physical, and moral flaws if they weren't kept forcibly and permanently in check. When in an 8-1 decision, the Supreme Court ruled it was in the state's interest to sterilize her, they legitimized the thousands and thousands of sterilizations that would follow at the colony and all over the country. And they underwrote the eugenicist philosophy on which Hitler would later base his law for the prevention of genetically diseased offspring. When Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., then an associate justice, delivered the court's famous ruling, he wrote, three generations of imbeciles are enough. Almost 20 years later, Nazi doctors at the Nuremberg trials would cite that language as a defense. 
The colony's history was a record of violence and discrimination that would radiate outwards beyond national boundaries for generations to come. It reverber ver reverberated quietly inside my own life. As seminal a case as Buck v. Bell was, there's remarkably little information from the years in the 1930s and 1940s at the height of the colony's sterilization practices. Patient accounts are especially few and far between. In a regional newspaper story from the early 1990s, a Virginia reporter describes tracking down a former colony patient who was released as a young woman and then spent her entire adult life trying to have children. Essentially, the reporter had to sit at the woman's kitchen table, look at her in her wheelchair and tell her her own story. This is what was done to you. This is the great shroud over your life and you didn't even know about it. Reading it, I wondered how the woman's face had altered then if shock or grief or anger had bloomed first. I wondered if there was some relief in having even an awful explanation. There's a list of operations in my own life that help make me who I am, but I have a record of every time a surgeon cut me open, the names of things the doctors declared wrong with me, the parts of me they've altered. I've lived my whole life with these catalogs. What would it be like to lack them? or to have a stranger arrive one day at the home I'd made bearing all that knowledge. The virtual absence of patient accounts of colony life during the eugenics movement is undoubtedly the result of a variety of forces. The lack of information inmates were given about their own histories and medical records, the pervasive sense that these defective people couldn't possibly have a meaningful perspective and experience worth attending to a complex and fully realized inner life and the amount of shame that surrounded being a former colony resident, even after inmates were released. All these things collided to produce a history characterized as much by absence and silence as anything else. Seeing the old pieces of the colony still standing there on the soil where I was raised in the mountains I always recognized and claimed, even when the landscape of my own body felt foreign, tugged at me continually after my first visit to the grounds but I wasn't ready to write about it immediately after passing through the gates. It would take me a few years to figure out how, and though I didn't know it then, it would require reckoning not just with my proximity to the colony and its history, but with the considerable space that shame and silence occupied in my own life. A year after finishing college, I was living in Texas and teaching creative writing part-time to inner city elementary school students. At 21, I was an inexperienced teacher and I struggled to control the kids in my classrooms. Released from the bounds of their usual school day, they leapt after one another between the aisles of their desks, moving faster than I could travel into spaces where my wheelchair wouldn't fit. I felt unsuited for the work and frankly for life in the world. Most days I came home in a lot of pain with my knees and ankles swollen. My body resisted everything I asked of it and I was tired terrified and furious. My life was not going according to plan. Originally, I'd moved to Texas for graduate school, admitted straight out of undergrad to a prestigious writer's workshop, but I'd been unable to pass a required math class my senior year of college or even a makeup course I'd taken online over the following summer. The same neurological damage that made my muscles spastic and my balance flawed also interrupted my ability to process numbers, space, and patterns. I'd gotten through high school math on a mix of hard work, charm, and the generosity of teachers who recognized my drive, but all my workarounds had limits. I was too ashamed to admit the degree to which I struggled or to face the fact that I was flawed and damaged even beyond the boundaries of my body. I'd always been a gunner, foot on the gas and eyes on the horizon, ambitious about a future that promised to be better than whatever present I was in. I went to college at 16, and after two years, I left my tiny Massachusetts liberal arts school for a big California university and all the opportunities it held. My intellect, I taught myself early on, was the one good part of me. So along the way, I developed the sense that if I were ambitious and extraordinary enough, if I did everything flawlessly and never stopped moving, I could outrun the truth of my body, leave it behind in the wake of all my excellence. But no matter where I was, my brain fired stray signals across the same flawed circuit. My tendons pulled too tight and my joints ached a little louder every year. I hurled myself from one city to another, one achievement to the next, 
But now the truth of my damage was intruding even on my mind. When just a few weeks into my first semester of graduate school, I found out that even with tutoring, I hadn't done well enough on the final exam to pass the summer calculus course. I had to withdraw from the MFA program because I couldn't get a bachelor's degree immediately in hand. Eventually, I got documentation to confirm, to confirm my disability's cognitive effects and petitioned my university to waive the math requirement for my BA. I found the teaching job, restructured my life, but I no longer felt like I had any idea who I was. All the ways I understood myself as smart, successful, useful had been decimated and everything I did felt animated by some combination of shame and grief and rage. The familiarity of the hills and valleys where I was raised had always been a source of steadiness in my life, and I turned toward trying to write about the colony, partly out of a reflexive impulse to return to that landscape. But I was also casting around for something that mattered, a way to contribute, to understand and articulate the histories of brains and bodies like mine, a way to face myself as I truly was. Thank you so much for joining us, and we're going to remind our listeners to Pick up your recent collection of essays, Places I've Taken My Body, along with your poetry collection, The Virginia State Colony for Epileptics and Feeble-Minded. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining us.